m'a dit que le micro, il se coupait sur la voix. Good afternoon or good evening if you're joining us from France and thanks very much for tuning in. I'm Dr. Stacy Pettyjohn, the Director of the Defense Program at the Center for a New American Security. Joining me here today at the CNAS virtual fireside is General Terry Burkhard, French Chief of Defense. General Burkhard, welcome. Thank you for being here. I know that there's a lot going on in the world at this moment, so we appreciate you taking the time to have this conversation with us. Today, we're gonna to discuss the French Armed Forces strategy and the challenges of maintaining a global presence in the time of shifting geopolitics, especially with the war in the Ukraine and uh, ongoing counterterrorism operations in Western Africa. Before we get into substance, however, I'll just run through a few quick administrative notes. Um, today's fireside is going to be a little bit different than usual because we're going to have an interpreter to help us uh, with the discussion. The conversation will be public, it's recorded, and will be posted on our website after uh, the event is over. We're gonna reserve some time uh, throughout for questions from the audience. So if you have them, please enter them in the chat box at the bottom. But remember, um, we do not accept anonymous questions, so be sure to identify yourself. Um, with that, I think we're gonna jump into the conversation here. Um, General Burkhardt, I, I wanted to begin our conversation with uh, your 2021 strategic vision, which uh, seemed very uh, visionary uh, given what has happened um, in the world. It emphasized preparing for a high-end fight against a state adversary, um, uh, which was a major departure from the prior several decades of French strategy. Can you generally explain what this transformation uh, will entail for the French armed forces and what the French military will look like at the end of it? Good afternoon. Thank you for your question. If you don't mind, I will just start by quickly describe what the strategic vision is setting up. The first thing is that the strategic approach is something that is uh, totally relevant. And we should see the world with three levels, competition, dispute, confrontation. Competition is a normal way of operating. We see it every day. And it's some competition in all domains, cultural, economic, sports, of course, and of course, military or insecurity issues. So for me, this competition situation is, if you like, already a war before the war. The second step is the dispute. That's when one of the competitors thinks he can grab an opportunity and impose his will by imposing a fait accompli. And Crimea is a good example of dispute where the Russians imposed the fait accompli by, of course, using hybrid strategies in order to prevent the intervention of the other competitors. So this is a war just before the war. Now, the confrontation is, of course, when a competition and a dispute phase has uh, finished and one of the um, adversaries uh, is escalating the situation more or less swiftly, which ends up in a more or less generalized confrontation. And in the end, you have the war. And the war is what you can see uh, nowadays in Ukraine. So, what we can see is that with this um, approach, it seems that for our countries, we absolutely need to win the war before the war. That is to say, to impose ourselves upon our competitors before, right from the competition phase on, and avoid to be in a situation of dispute, then we would have to act very swiftly and avoid to be in a confrontation phase 
in which case we would have to be able to commit our forces. So the strategy of the French army now is to, war, to win the war before the war, as soon as the uh, competition phase on, and to be able to win this com to win this competition phase, we need to be credible and to have forces that are able to commit themselves. Actually, but the effort has to be done during the competition phase. Thank you for that, sir. Um, those distinctions resonate with a lot of the ways that the U.S. military is also thinking about uh, the competitive space and uh, the sort of um, different types of conflict and competition that are going on all the time. Um, clearly, we want to be able to strengthen deterrence and to avoid disputes or outright war uh, whenever possible. Um, your strategic vision had uh, was entitled, it had 2030 in the title, which suggests that we had a certain amount of time to prepare to put in place these changes to actually avoid disputes and win the pre-conflict or the competition phase. Um, the war in Ukraine has demonstrated that the threat might be more urgent and that we might not have that amount of time uh, to make preparations. What are your plans in the near term uh, to improve the French forces' preparedness for high-intensity conflict? You're right. The strategic vision was designed for 2030, but this strategic vision belongs to the strategic review that was done in 2017. That would provide the country with the necessity to be able to confront powerful states by 2030. So, you know, there's a the, uh, military programming law that it was set up in 2019 for five years, uh, which was a first step, and then be able, uh, with the next step, to be prepared, fully prepared in 2030 to uh, face powerful states. The first programming law uh, was uh, 2019-2025 is pretty new because uh, the budgets were very much increased, so 300 billion euros for the French defense. But I think that the military is aware that to build up forces so that we can uh, fight against other states requires a huge effort. And this was the case for the French army who had been committed in uh, wars against terrorist groups for 20 years, which are hard conflicts because they are slowly suffer in these conflicts. But however, we realize that there is true difference of level between carrying out these operations and being able today to wage wars between states. And high intensity conflict is a true different scale compared to counterinsurrection or counterterrorism uh, operation that we have carried out in the 20 last year. So I think it doesn't mean that we are not ready today to engage in a high intensity conflict. We would do this with the asset that we have now. But this ambition for me is uh, has to uh, requires time and. Of course, we need to improve our equipment, modernize our equipment. That's what we're doing with the Scorpion program for the French army, with new ships, warships for the Navy, with the uh, extension uh, of the uh, Rafale fighter for the, uh, the Air Force. But this is not something we can do within uh, to, very quickly. So then we need to be able to do to train the units for high intensity conflicts. And there are some soldiers who are listening to me now and the researchers and know uh, what operations are like. And, you know, it's very complicated to carry out operations against terrorist groups, but the dimension in a high intensity conflict is totally different. And we do not only need to train at company level, but at battalion, brigade, division, and army corps level. And this is something that requires time because this is a very complicated uh, issue. And 
que l'armée russe aujourd'hui, quand on um, I realized that when you have a look at the Russian army and the, their current operations, they clearly are not that ready to carry high intensity operations. And they are lacking some, some seamlessness. There's lack of initiative with the units in the front. Maybe the artillery supports and as synchronous as it should be with the airstrikes. So I think that it's not really a surprise because this is something that requires huge efforts. And that's why you probably saw it, that the French army came to train uh, at the aggressive strike factor with the US army, with the US division, a UK division and a French division for over a month on a high intensity army corps level conflict. And that's what the track we should follow now. And thinking that we could be prepared again for intensity in short deadlines is not possible. It is very complicated. And again, it doesn't mean that we're not able right now to be engaged in high intensity conflicts, but not with all the assets that we have identified at the level of training we expect to reach by 2030. Of course, the situation today shows it that we need to speed up the process, but let us not lie to ourselves because that would not be uh, honest and uh, that's what the intervention in ukraine by the russian army is showing negatively this is something that requires a lot of efforts and a lot of time that is uh clearly true that the scale is different and that we're also seeing that potential adversaries like russia are having challenges with large operations and um, fighting in a modern combined arms way that many would have expected. Um, balancing these different time pressures and what you can do now versus what we can do in the future. I wanna talk a little bit more about the future, but before I get to that, we have a question from Aaron and uh, that wanted your uh, impressions and thoughts on the idea of whether an American Polish deal to give Ukraine some of Poland's old uh, Russian made uh, aircraft makes sense. This is one of these near term opportunities to bolster Ukraine's capabilities um, that can be done quickly. Um, do you think that that's a good idea, sir? Hello. First thing, the support of France, but also of NATO and Europe to Ukraine is something that is very strong that is on a voluntary basis, very voluntaristic actually, but everybody understands that we cannot become co-belligerents. And this is the thin line, the thin thread we are walking on. More precisely, but should we help Ukraine? Of course we have to. Should we provide them with weapons? Yes, we have to do this. We have to do this in a reasonable way and we have to be careful to keep a level of visibility and of will that is mastered. Let me explain this. We can do many things. We are not compelled to do too much communication and publicity uh, about this. This is something that the Russians are totally understand and they have not uh, forbidden us uh, they are uh, forbidden from uh, us from providing ukraine with weapons uh, ukraine is also uh, allowed to uh, purchase weapons like russia is doing it so but the support that is brought by european countries and nato is something that needs to be done but not necessarily communicated upon and become a tool of communication what is so we shouldn't communicate too much about this. There's certainly concerns about escalation and, you know, remaining um, uh, supportive of Ukraine, which is a partner and defending NATO allies, which uh, France has done very, uh, made very strong statements and gestures in that direction. Um, in that, uh, France had come out and offered to send forces to Romania previously uh, there are already French forces in Estonia as a part of the enhanced forward presence. Do you expect um, the French uh, presence in Eastern uh, Europe to grow uh, soon? Concerning the French commitment within NATO, 
to contribute to the deterrence and defense um, maneuver. This is a very strong investment involvement, of France, and you have mentioned it. Starting with the air component, with regular contribution of the French Air Force in air defense missions in the Baltic states. Currently, this is something that we've made progress on. We are actually in advance and we are able to multiply by two the number of fighters. There were already some Belgian fighters and we are setting up four additional French fighters before taking the mission in our own hands. Very quickly, when the invasion of Ukraine started, the French Air Force and the framework of the build-up and the strengthening of the air defense on the line above Poland, the Baltic States and Romania has committed at least two air patrols of fighters, of Rafale fighters, with um, air fueling uh, aircraft above Poland under NATO command. We have also included in this mission fighters from the uh, Navy group, from the Charles de Gaulle aircraft carrier, which is located in the Adriatic Sea, together with a Truma US aircraft carrier to set up uh, every day two patrols, air patrols above Romania. We are also carrying out electronic intelligence, electronic warfare. Uh, missions that are coordinated with those of NATO and Poland, Romania and Bulgaria. That's the air layout concerning the maritime Navy layout. Beside the uh, Navy group we have in the Adriatic Sea, we have a group of ships in the eastern part of the Mediterranean, Mediterranean especially in the Sierra Canal, to uh, control the uh, outlet of the Black Sea and also the activities in Syria. Concerning the land forces, we have the aircraft being carried out in Norway in the framework of a visibility and strategic uh, visibility by the VGTF, that is the uh, Rapid Reaction Force of NATO, and the Agnes of Brian John. There are above 2,700 um, soldiers involved in this, and this is um, carried out by SECURE. For several years, we have been involved in the EFP mission in Lithuania and Estonia. We were supposed to complete our deployment of one year, but we and we are currently being relieved by a Danish company. We have decided to maintain a company for an indefinite period of time in order to double our presence in this phase. So this is a true strategic solidarity with the Estonians. That, so our presence is very important in that framework uh, within a battalion that is currently under British command and their training and deterrence level is really high. Finally, SECURE asked how to deploy forces swiftly in Romania, and in that framework he asked for the deployment of the VGTF battalion, the Sparehead battalion, so that was the highest alert level, so we deployed within less than seven days a battalion of 500 men, which is being complemented with a Belgium company of some 200 men. So that's a battalion with 700 men. It was deployed by strategic airlift with 40 rotations of strategic airlift aircraft. And it's being, being deployed in Romania, getting in touch with taking contact with the Romanian forces to be in embedded in their defense plan in order to deter or to defend the NATO borders. So this is to sum up the deployment and the involvement, the commitment of the French armed forces in the permanent reinforced and hence presence of NATO. Thank you for that, sir. I wasn't aware of the extent to which French forces were involved across these different activities in Europe. Um, it's truly impressive, especially when we think about all of the other global commitments. 
But before we turn to that, I want to talk a little bit about uh, return to the strategic vision and think about your uh, plans for transforming the French armed forces and your modernization plans. What would you say are your top three priorities um, over the next eight years um, in terms of being able to uh, realize the transformation that you've undertaken? Alors, en ce qui concerne les priorités. What are our priorities? Check, check, check. Alors, je pense que les priorités, si on peut I les... Think... Our priorities, they're not really identified as such, but the first priority, I think that for the French armed forces, we need to recover a true capability to think at a strategic level. It is probably, was probably a mistake, but the, you know, wars and kind of limited wars in Afghanistan or Iraq did not really require to to analyze at a strategic level is probably a mistake and we can see some consequences right now so we really need truly need to be able to have a strategic approach of the situation our adversaries our enemies are doing that so this is essential for me this requires two aspects to have a strategic overview, to recover a true capability to anticipate on the various theaters of operation, Afghanistan, Iraq, Mali. It's not really capability to anticipate. You always have the initiative, and this is not something that is lethal a danger if we have missed something. Uh, but uh, if we're not able to uh, anticipate what's going to happen, not able to take measures to anticipate, we will we might lose against a true strong enemy. So, and this is that's where we need to develop a true strategic solidarity. We have the alliances, which is a collective defense, but we need to have true strategic solidarities that are set up with our allies. The second thing is, with the rearming of many countries, development of very powerful uh, weapons that uh, can reach very far in depth, we need to be uh, able to deter uh, them from firing these weapons and we need to think differently and we should not always answer in a direct way to the threat that we are facing. Acting and thinking differently also means to be able to detect and not fall into the trap that is set by our competitors or adversaries who, who are trying to lead us into this trap. So we should not being uh, acting at the place where they want us to act. The third point, I think this is quite interactive. We need to make a huge effort in immaterial fields, that is to say, the war of perceptions, to better synchronize, improve the synchronization, information war, and kinetic actions. This is something on which the French armed forces need to make a huge effort. And I am realizing that the Ukrainian army is really well prepared for information, the war information. They are imposing their narrative to the Russian army and to, to Russia and actually to the whole world who is witnessing this. We need to learn a lot on the way the Ukrainian army is playing in the immaterial field and in the war of perceptions, I think there is a, a feedback, uh, a lessons learned that we need to analyze. So for me, the immaterial field, this is probably the main shift on which to, we have to be able to get involved fully. That all makes a lot of sense, sir. It's clearly, um, uh, sort of deeper than just 
changing the equipment that you have, there's a cultural shift, a mindset, mindset shift in terms of being prepared to fight a uh, capable uh, thinking adversary, developing competitive strategies that needs to happen. As I looked at the plan that you've laid out um, uh, for the next five years, there are some um, interesting differences that stood out to me compared to what you've seen other countries like the United Kingdom or the United States, what they're planning on doing. The UK shrinking its force and reducing its investment in heavy ground forces, but your strategy actually emphasizes the role of ground troops and armor. Can you discuss the rationale for this? And um, as a part of it, can you provide an update on the Scorpion program? I read with a lot of interest the strategic review that was carried out by the uh, British Army. There's a lot of interesting stuff that is not totally different from what the French Army is doing. So if we read carefully, we are following kind of parallel ways. I would say there are two differences. You underline the one which is indeed the British decision to shrink the heavy um, forces, but the other one is to uh, make an effort on the material fields and the British Army has really high skills in that field and the effort they're making makes sense. And we need to do this too. Concerning the heavy um, sector, I think it's not, a, I'm not criticizing that, but what is making the difference between the French and British armies is that for the French army, the commitment in a high intensity conflict is planned to be done in a coalition. So in, in, in the framework of, of a collective um, uh, commitment with our allies. So that's how we have dimension army. But we, for the French army, for the chart that I am of the French army, of the French armed forces, I should never be in a situation where I need to see the president of the Republic as the chief of the armed forces and tell him, sir, I'm sorry, I cannot do anything. It would be much more complicated than in a coalition. Uh, probably it will be much more complicated. And I think that that is something that is really essential. And in that field, I think that if the French army wants to remain credible, which is important to win the war before the war, but to be able to be committed, we, we need to have armies that are credible and also have a heavy component in order to uh, be able to deter, but we need to make an effort to increase our volume in that field. And I think this is also something that is important. If we have a true will to want to be a framework nation, it's very difficult to be a framework nation if you are not able to to uh, set up a command structure with a support structure. If you're not able as a French nation to put some armor or to put the, uh, some decisive forces that will be uh, in, in the midst of the uh, engagement, the commitment, you will not be credible. And France might be a French nation, so we need also to have in the air in maritime and land field, we need to have the capability to have comprehensive assets, including armor. And we would, if we should, didn't have that, we would waste our credibility. And that's how the posture, the format, and organization of the uh, French armed forces is planned. Now, concerning the Scorpion program, which is a program of modernization of the army. This is something that aims at digitalizing all land forces in order to be able to exchange information very quickly, but also to improve the uh, operational pace in able to be able to impose our will on the opponent. If I can go a bit into details and uh, give you an example, it's a bit like if the vehicles that we're developing now, like the Griffon, 
which is infantry fighting vehicle, or the Serva, which is a bit lighter vehicle for uh, medium-sized brigades, the future uh, uh, combat battle tank. Uh, this is, these are our current smartphones for smartphones of today. Like, they, they cannot uh, have any kind of aggression with the phone, but it's the ability to share and transmit information. So this is something that is providing some good results. But for the smartphone to work well, we need to have the 5G and the ticket system, which is the SIGF system, which is the uh, communications and information system that is currently being uh, set up. We have already deployed in the uh, Sahel Saharan Strip in Mali. We have a battalion that is equipped with Griffon vehicles, and they are equipped with the SIGF communication system. It, we had some great results. Even if, for me, this is not in a war, uh, uh, this is not in counterterrorism that it can show the best results it can provide. But we're using it at a company battalion level and at brigade level. There is a true transformation in the way we conduct operations and with better seamlessness and capability to better survive on a battlefield. The survivability of the units, especially of command posts, is something we need to be very vigilant on. And the use of the Scorpion plan system, both by the new vehicles with the powerful aggression and uh, communication sensors for the whole CF bubble uh, that connects all of them is a true driver. That's very interesting. I didn't realize that. And it sounds very familiar to what we've heard in the United States military with either all domain operations or joint all domain command and control, where you're trying to link up forces from different domains and make sure that they're passing information in a way to gain an advantage on the battlefield. Do you anticipate that um, France's networks and like the Scorpion digitization program will be interoperable with NATO and American uh, systems so that they can actually operate seamlessly together? You're right. Interoperability is something that is essential. Interoperability starts at the communication level. The military has an, a decisive role in that field. The, uh, the, the weapons industry, weapon manufacturers need to build systems that are compatible because the soldiers who will use this on the field, if they're not able to speak in a simple way, they will not be able to use it. Having Great equipment is something you understand, but the most important thing is to be able to have a system we, that we can exchange with. But we need to massively develop a communication system that talk with each other. It's not the case nowadays. So this is something on which the military need uh, to impose that the systems are able to talk to each other. Uh, it's not only the case uh, of the French armies who are facing this and uh, uh, witnessing this deployment in some European uh, NATO countries of the F-35, which is posing some problems. And the F-35 is designed as a really a very effective, efficient system, has great qualities, but it's designed as a very closed system. And that's, I think this is this is a mistake because the systems that are deployed within NATO countries have to be deployed to be compatible with the other systems in use within NATO. So we need to make sure that they are compatible and interoperable in a very massive way. I think we're not making progress in the right direction in that field. That is. Um Concerning, it's certainly something that needs to be addressed in the near term. One last question, uh, sort of focused on Europe before we turn to Africa and the Indo Pacific, because we've had some questions there, and I know um, we want to cover some of uh, the, your activities in those regions. Um, from Patrick, he asked um, 
what you, your advice would be about the level and scope of military assistance that NATO uh, members should be providing to Ukraine self-defense forces. If aircraft are too escalatory, where's the red line? Is it um, unmanned aerial vehicles like the ones that Turkey provides, land attack anti-ship missiles? What, what do you think is uh, appropriate and not risky? On this topic, my own feeling is that today there, is no, there are no true embargo measures that were declared against the belligerents neither for the Russians nor for the Ukrainians. So it makes sense, it's not abnormal that Ukraine can still uh, receive weapons. And that's what Russia is also doing. So they're still uh, acquiring ammunition and weapons. But I think that our objective is to help Ukraine and to keep our level of commitment and the risk to become involved in the war at the lowest possible level. So this is something that needs to be done directly with Ukraine, but it is important in terms of communication to remain as the most unobtrusive as possible. And the Russians can accept a certain number of things, but they cannot accept that we overtly support Ukraine. Where is the red line? I think it depends on our smartness. The less we can we say, it, the more we can do. We need to remain very inoperative about this and avoid any kind of provocation that could come from either belligerent. Okay, let, let's turn our attention to uh, Africa, and um, this is another area where um, there's been a lot of transition and change in the last few months. Um, last year, you, France announced that it was ending its longstanding counterterrorism operation in the Sahel. And then in February, just last month, it was announced that you're withdrawing all of your forces from Mali, which has been um, one of your critical nodes within West Africa. Can you discuss your plans for your military posture in the West African region and um, how you are going to conduct counterterrorism operations going forward? First, I think it's not a withdrawal of the French forces or disengagement. It's first, we need to continue the fight against terrorism because there are still terrorist groups. We need to rearrange our layout because nowadays the political conditions, especially in Mali, are not met anymore. They are not met anymore because, first, the Mali government is not a legitimate government. It has been set up with a coup and it is refusing to respect the transition that should bring it to election that should have uh, taken place in February. So this is a true problem of legitimacy uh, of the government with which we're supposed to be working. And you totally understood that Russia has deployed a group of mercenaries, Wagner, not to name it, that is fighting in direct support of the Malian forces. The Malian forces with which we are cooperating to conduct combat operations. We cannot accept to work with the Malians together with a, we're still working together with a group of mercenaries. We have seen them acting in Central Africa. We are monitoring the situation. We know uh, the high level of violence that is occurring over there, but with the counterproductive effects on the country itself, Central Africa, Nowadays, Mali in the close future, the effect of predation, 
they are stealing resources. Wagner is a company. They need to make money. So that's by stealing resources in the country that they can make money. And they do this in one of the uh, poorest countries in the world. The second thing that is important for me as a soldier, but is, that is very important if you want to have a look at the positive evolution of the situation is that this company of mercenaries is using uh, local uh, armies uh, in, in, um, in different parts. Their aim is not to build up the Malian or Central African army because when they are once they are autonomous, we will, we will they will not need Wagner anymore. So of course that's not how a uh, company that needs to make money will work. So Wagner by using small groups of soldiers, not and not within the structures that are designed for that, not with uh, soldiers who have been trained, they are going against the possibility uh, for these armies to gain their autonomy. But the autonomy of African um, countries is the only solution to fight and win against terrorism in Africa. It's not the commitment of foreign armies that will defeat terrorism in Africa or anywhere of course, the former in, in a village in Mali, if he had to choose between the terrorist group and the French or Swedish soldier, or I don't know, Italian soldier, he will immediately understand that the terrorist is the one who will stay longer. So if we want to have a chance for the former or the villager, uh, not uh, to uh, be defeated by terrorists. Only his national army will be able to defeat the terrorists. So, so this goes through developing the autonomy of these African armies. Wagner goes against this. And that's the reason for which the president of the Republic decided it was not possible anymore to fight against terrorism in Mali. But the fight against terrorism is continuing, and especially by supporting both uh, countries, Niger or Burkina Faso, that are decisive in this uh, uh, fight. And we're already engaged in this in these countries. But there is a second main axis, main effort, which is to improve and accelerate, speed up the support we are providing to the African countries of the Gulf of Guinea. They are already beginning to feel the pressure, the buildup of uh, terrorist groups to the south. So it's now the time to help them so that they very quickly gain their own autonomy and be able to, to uh, fight these terrorist groups by themselves before the threat becomes too strong against them. The very condition for this to work is for the Western armies, and especially the French army, and even the countries, is to be able to understand how now we can change the way we are present in Africa. And we need to be able to provide what the countries need and not what we need. we think they should take. I think this is one of the aspects that our action can be criticized. Uh, they do not have what, what they know that they need. And we will never transform the Malian or Nigerian or Burkina uh, army in a NATO army. That's a total illusion. These guys will never be able to cope with us. We, we can need them and in the support we provide them, we need to provide them what with what they need to embed, to integrate, and with which they can be very strong. To me, this is the true challenge. Of course, our the rearrangement of our layout, um, uh, of course, will be done with uh, in different ways, but we need to develop a capability to change the way we are present. And this will require from us a true change in our habits and a new approach, the ability to think together, to build together with the African countries, the European countries, with France, uh, the way we want to be present in Africa in a new way. And this is the major challenge. We uh, have a few months ahead to talk together. There are some uh, uh, working groups that have been started, planning groups, and we need at least two or three months 
to be able to find the right plan that it will not be able to be implemented in in a block but this is the only way we need to improve their autonomy and when they fight against terrorism in that field there's another thing that is important that's communication and influence and of course it's, it's not enough to have european french uh, armed forces that fight again uh, well along our african countries that's the case in Mali. it's important to keep good relationships with the malian army but what we need is that these countries and armies are able to explain to the population why a foreign um, army it has come here upon their request the government to help them we need to help the african countries to do this and this is something that is essential so let's take a now defunct american uh defense term let's pivot to the indo-pacific quickly i've had a couple of questions from brian and mark uh on this region and we're running short on time i want to leave you a couple of minutes to offer some concluding thoughts so uh i'm going to group these together here we know that French is, france is an indo-pacific power you have territories from the indian ocean to the southwest pacific um, Brian wants to know what you see as the French military's role in the Indo-Pacific, given the new situation in Europe. And Mark had asked whether the French Navy would continue to be operating in that region. I know they have in the past. There was a quad exercise that I believe um, the French Navy led last year, or in uh, yes, in the spring of last year. Do you anticipate to be able to make those type of commitments, given um, that you have large commitments to European defense, to Africa. Um, what do you see going forward in the Indo-Pacific region? Concerning the Indo-Pacific region, France has its own interest in this Indo-Pacific region. France has about a, over 1 million of square kilometers of um, exclusive in economic interest zones. I think it's 1.2 million uh, people with a French passport, New Caledonia, the Réunion, the French Polynesia, and we have a military presence, about 7,000 soldiers in these three areas. So France has its own economic, military, cultural interest in these areas. So that's the first thing. Second thing is that France, of course, is fully committed in the will to have its values being respected, a freedom of movement uh, on the sea, in the air, but also concerning the governance. So France knows it has to be involved in this. France must do this with its allies and coordinate. Um, but um, there are some facts that are uh, imposed on us when we have a look at the world in a concentric way. Of course, the Indo Pacific area is very far from Europe, very far from France. So we need to be aware of this and we cannot. Uh, believe that we're able to have a pres presence in that area that is as strong as it is in our European uh, continent area. But we need to play a major role, especially in this competition phase. We need to assert our will in coordination with our allies, of course, and uh, with our American ally, who is our major. Uh, ally, of course, but also with Australia, which is one of the biggest countries in the Indo Pacific area. We need to coordinate with them and with the other European countries. Now, it's pretty clear that during dispute or confrontation phases, uh, and it's quite obvious, I think nobody's surprised for the French army committing a force on the Indo Pacific theater is something that is, that is not really realistic for two reasons as i told you because of the distance because that would require a huge uh, logistic and uh, strategic deployment capabilities to be deployed efficiently in that area 
uh, we will not be we cannot play a major role in case of confrontation we don't uh, deploy heavy equipment so the second reason for which it's not realistic is that if the situation is becoming tense and we need to confront an adversary in the indo-pacific region i do not believe any second that the situation will not deteriorate in the indian ocean in the mediterranean or in the atlantic and most probably the most of the u.s assets will be uh, moved to the uh, to the area of confrontation and we need to uh, commit our own assets so it makes sense to distribute the roles and missions in the world in case of a confrontation in the Indo-Pacific area. So there's no will of not being present, my friends. We need to be able to act um, in a coordinated way with our European, Australian and American allies. But let's be clear, this, this is something that is very far away where we need to be able to defend our interests. And we need to be to do this collectively, and this could not be a theater of operation that would be ma a major one for us. But we already have some forces that are permanently deployed over there. We are working on being able to deploy air assets quickly. Um, we train to be able to deploy a group of seven to eight Rafale fighters with uh, air fuelers in order to be able to carry operation in the Indo-Pacific area. But it cannot be the highest priority and cannot be done as a major uh, um, engagement. That makes a lot of sense to me. You need to prioritize and, uh, you know, there is the tyranny of distance. Um, we're about out of time here, so I wanted you to I wanted to offer you the opportunity to offer a few concluding remarks um, before we sign off. I think if I may conclude with some words, I think that the world, as it is changing now, in a very swift way, it shows we need to be able to work together and to avoid ambiguous stances. I haven't seen all the questions, but I think there's a true topic about European defense and the defense of defense of Europe. And in that field, we need to be able to uh, to work about the European defense and NATO. This is a wrong fight for European collective defense. First and foremost, NATO. And this is something that is very important. It's NATO first with the Americans. No single European country, I think, believes that if one day they need we need to go into a fight, and this is something we should not exclude. We sh no country is saying that the Americans cannot be with us. They need to be with us. And this is something that is very important. However, I think for France and all the European countries, we cannot also say that if for some kind of reason, the Americans cannot or do not want to get involved, then we will not be able to do anything. And that's the reason why Europe also has to develop its own capabilities, not to uh, substitute for NATO or a collective defense that would include the Americans, but to be sure that if one day the Americans cannot be there, then Europe would still be able to defend itself. And this is something I, I think is very important. And we should not oppose European defense and NATO. They are very much connected and NATO is being reinforced when the European defense is reinforcing itself. That's the thing. Second thing, strategic solidarity is something that we need to develop, and the military have a true role to play in that. We need to develop relations between the countries, and I often give the example of the way France has set up a true strategic uh, relationship and, uh, uh, with Estonia and still consolidating it with uh, Romania. These are no exclusive um, strategic solidarities. Conversely, they are open and they should allow to develop interoperability, efficiency, and ability to uh, to be engaged together with other allies. 
Voilà, maintenant sur la situation en Ukraine. Uh, situation in Ukraine. La situation est extrêmement grave. Uh, I think the situation is very serious. A country decided to wage an open war against another one to impose its will. It's the first time since 1945. We are learning that to, to do peace, we need to be two, but to wage a war, only one is enough. And this is something we need to protect ourselves against, and all our forces are here to be ready, to be committed, and to defend the values and the interests of our country. And this is what France is trying to do, is fully involved. France knows it has to be done in a collective way, and we know we can rely on the really high cohesion uh, cohesiveness of all the European countries, but we are monitoring the situation in Ukraine. I think that the, the problem is that the Russian army is facing against Ukraine is something that is really good. And I think that we should all uh, show our admiration to what the Ukrainian army is doing in a very courageous way. The more the Russians will face difficulties, the more, the more dangerous the situation will become. So the, the connection, the links need to be kept. But of course, the main objective of Putin is to break the cohesion of the alliance countries. And our governments and military chiefs need to do everything they can to consolidate our cohesiveness. Thank you, sir, for those concluding remarks. Um, we've had a, you know, clearly the world faces a, a large number of serious security challenges today, um, and we've covered a number of them. Um, I've really enjoyed and learned a lot from hearing your perspective and uh, enjoyed our conversation. So thank you for joining me here. Merci beaucoup. Très intéressant. Thank you very much. This was very interesting. We did not have time to go deeply into all topics, but I can see that your think tank is uh, very uh, proactive in developing a lot of stuff. We didn't have time to talk about war gaming because uh, this is something we should develop and better use. We should develop a gaming lab. And, and this is very interesting. If I come to the US, I will, of course, be very much interested in checking on this. That would be great, sir. Um, please do so. Have a good afternoon, everyone, or evening.